So welcome to Cookie Monster Gonna Starve. We're here to learn about how to future-proof our marketing for when there is a time where third-party cookies no longer exist. So I'd like to start by prefacing that all of you right now in this room are the smartest marketers for being here today and joining this talk specifically because this topic is arguably one of the largest disruptors in our industry right now. How long have we relied on other parties to tell us about our audiences, right? So right now we might be investing and in speaking with networks that have been telling us about our audiences, but think back to your traditional marketing. Before you ever invested in placing a television ad or a print media ad, you always asked their teams for a media kit. And in that media kit was information about your audiences and you knew and had that information in order to make the executive decision to place that advertising. So if these actions of using third party information have been going on for decades, it is going to be a huge shakeup internally to figure out how to rework your strategies and your data and your own information uh, so that you have this own powerful tool. So my name is Samantha Kermode. Um, I come to you from Phoenix, Arizona, one of the very first times I get to speak in my own state here. And my job is to break down hard, complex topics so that they're easy to consume and understand for the everyday marketer. So today my job and goal is to speak English to you about very technical topics um, and changes that are happening. And this isn't new. We've been hearing about third-party cookies for years now. If you Google the topic, you're going to get at least half a billion articles all about what you should do and what's happening and the changes uh, and the new news from Google, right? So I'm going to give you an actionary plan today. And I find it very ironic because you might be sitting in your chairs and we're all very upset that cookies are disappearing as marketers. Oh, no, we're not going to be able to track our audiences. But as human beings and as consumers, we're like, no, we want our privacy, right? We don't want to be tracked. This is our right. So it's just ironic that, you know, both sides, it, de it depends what seat you sit in. Um, but ultimately, we need to prepare. So let me start by going back to the top. There's a couple different kinds of, kinds of cookies out there. And first-party cookies were one of the first. It originated on websites so that they could store your information to give you that more personalized experience. So your information stored, so things like login preferences or options that you might have clicked are saved. And so that when you come back, you're happy that you're still logged in. Where cookies have gotten a bad rap is with third-party cookies that are giving information, sharing information with third-party networks. And this is streamed across all different kinds of websites, and they're following you. Obviously, this is negative. This is where everyone is shaking their head and saying, that's not exactly right. So if you head to a popular website like CNN.com, and I only use this news organization as one example because my guess is, is that they're getting millions of hits every single day. You're hit with thousands. You're being tracked by thousands of different cookies all at once. And this is, this is huge. This is behind the scenes. We don't even usually think about this unless maybe you sit on the analytics team, right, or the paid media team. You're thinking about the information that you're shared all the time. So what these networks are gaining is not only information about the sites we hit, but what we're doing. And they're starting to piece the story together. And this is what we use as marketers then, these characteristics and this information to then better target our advertising. So if you're a user hitting a BuzzFeed dog page, it doesn't end there. They're tracking you for days when you hit on PetSmart or Petco, finally maybe even a product page. And then these networks like you know, Google or Facebook, these ad platforms, can start to learn your actual characteristics. So they're learning that not only are you an animal lover, you actually own a dog, and you actually might even prefer a certain kind of pet food, right? So all of this has been on the outside of our companies going forward. We pay to partner with other partners that tell us this sort of uh, information. So again, this is not a new topic, though. Third-party cookies don't right now exist on Apple or iOS right, or Safari. The reason for the hype is that Google has finally announced that they're going to uh, remove third-party cookies. Now, I was going to be able to get to stand up here and 
express to you how urgent this was because initially it was supposed to happen in 2023. They now have changed the date again to 2024 as they prepare their own platforms um, so advertisers aren't lost. However, this is the time to start caring about your internal strategies. We should not wait until 2024 just to figure out what it is we're going to do when third-party cookies are no longer here. So let's talk about a world without third-party cookies. What does that actually look like? It's going to boil down to two main pain points. This is why everyone's freaking out, right? We're going to have less of, a of an ability to target our key audiences based on those meaty characteristics and those buying habits. And then secondly, our internal teams are not used to working off of things like first party data. We are used to going to third party partners as we have for decades to ask about our audiences and where we should be placing advertisements and why to get the best ROI. So if these are the two problems, we need to solve them. But remember, we do have first party cookies still, right? So this first party data is going to be, become a bigger and bigger topic of conversation. Um, so today we really wanna focus on building up that first party data core at your companies and then mimicking and creating governances and processes around how you can use that data and information in your advertising moving forward. And the benefits are obviously, right, you're, you're following the rules um, when that day comes, when third party goes away. Um, but you also are increasing customer trust right now if you're staying ahead. I already heard other conversations talking about that um, cookie pop-up uh, filter and asking people for permission. But you have internally, let's face it, right, we're all about ROI. That's all we really care about as marketers and CEOs and C-suite at the end of the day. You've got internal efficiencies and agilities. You can actually move faster in the long run with your own data. So my pro tip for you today is right now, if you don't already have this cookie consent banner on your website, install it tomorrow. Do your homework, find a provider that you like, install it now because you can start to build up this first party data of people who might opt in with you. Remember, third party cookies aren't gone yet. So just because somebody doesn't opt in does not mean that you can't track them right now. But what this does give you an edge on is building up that first party list. And I, I say this if you're not already international following GDPR compliances, right? In that case, you might have some geo filters installed for US versus EU. How many of you have this right now on your site? Oh, like eight people? Okay, you all have homework. So here's what happens. I'm a visual person, so I like to break this down. When there's no more trackable interactions, right? Cookies are gone, we need permission, everyone needs to opt in. What's gonna happen is if somebody lands on your website and they don't opt in on that banner, they do not provide you consent, you're not going to be able to know what page views they had, if they abandoned their cart, you know, what those interactions looked like. That's a problem. If they do give you consent, you now can store that information server side and you can learn all of those things that you might have right now in your own analytics. Things like uh, the page views, add to cart, the logins, the order completions, right? Those habits that you might be experiencing on your website. Now, all of this server-side tracking and first-party data, you can upload back into all of those advertising platforms you're using right now. Gives you the same benefits that you're seeing right now, only you own this information. The number one question everyone likes to ask is, how do we actually get consumers to opt into any of those kinds of forms? This is what enters the conversation of having really strong, valuable uh, content to trade for that data. If somebody is willing to give you their information, it has to be a really worthy trade. So I'm gonna show you a couple of examples here. ASICs is a shoe company for, I know all sorts of people wear ASICs, but let's face it, they're the really serious runners. Certainly not myself. I'm struggling to get through training just a 5K turkey trot right now. Um, these are for the marathon runners, right? And so what they did, knowing their audience who runs miles every day, they built a app that was cross-device that allows those runners to track all of their health usage, right? Their, their data, their whatever you track as a runner, heartbeat, right? Calories burned, I don't know, miles run, all in one place. And again, if you're a fan of ASICs, if you're giving into this, you are also opting in to them 
storing and holding your first party information. But you get something in return, right? You're not just signing up your name for nothing. There is an exchange happening here that they know their audience cares about because this is, this is their hobby every single day. Another example would be Global Cyclone Network, where within their marketing, they use surveys throughout a lot of their different materials, right? Somebody is answering, quite literally giving you their information by answering a question. We've got resource downloads. This is not new. This is like 101 of content marketing. Finally, I think we saw a, a true explosion in understanding of content marketing during um, the 2020 pandemic when people finally realized that they can't contact people in person, they needed stuff online. So now that there is hundreds, millions, I mean, billions of pieces of content on the internet, we have to be really, really resourceful and helpful, not just create more content to create more content, right? The topic that you are writing about has to be geared towards your audience and has to be so juicy that they are willing to trade their information for it. And then chatbot. So this is one more example of just another area that somebody can share their information with you and potentially opt in to you keeping their info stored, right? And so using a tool that will give you an automation feature is super helpful as well, because if you talk with your customer um, or sales customer support or sales team right now, they know the questions that are asked all the time. And you can kind of uh, take the guesswork out of the most frequently asked questions, right? Supply it right there on your website while obtaining data at the same time. So as you're thinking about developing these different content formats that can work for you to extract this first party intel, think about first and foremost, again, the 101 of content marketing, fill a need, fill a pain point, right? But at this point in time, and if you've got budget or the creativity to do so, think about how it can also maybe supply entertainment, connect people socially. Um, and of course, use different formats. I've heard that theme a couple of times, I think in the panel ahead of time, right? Um, just using different formats. And there's a couple of different ways you can kind of reach out to people throughout this process. Now, I show this slide with a bunch of different bullet points, if you will, because I'd like to remind you that some best practices that you're likely doing right now every single day to rank organically and outbeat your competitors, these same best practices can be applied to this content when you're looking for the information trade as well. So if you want to be competitive and outrank and outbeat everybody in your conversions, right, your conversions of information being shared, have deep expertise. These are not 300 word blog articles that are going to do it for you, right? You need to be really knowledgeable and resourceful and well cited. Sorry, this is delayed. Should I be clicking at a certain area? Um, be optimized. Obviously, you want your stuff to be found. While not everything may be found if it's gated organically, ask yourself how much you're willing to promote a piece to get the right audience in front of you. Speak to your audience. I chatted with some lo lovely folks today at lunch, and we were joking about how all companies, no matter who you are, have some sort of hard relationship with that internal jargon. We all want to use our own acronyms, our, our own trademarked names. Your audience may not know what that means, right? So do some research. Look at keywords um, that audiences are actually searching for most. Look at your competitor's website. What kind of vocabulary are they using? Uh, even interview your sales team. How do they speak on the phone with these different customers? Don't use jargon. Um, the only other key tip there would be to also throw in, um, as far as language research goes, if anybody's international, maybe looking at partnering with somebody in that market. So the semantics line up as well with different vocabulary and translation of words. <clears throat> and then again, longer is not always better. However, we are aiming for more robust pieces. Not everything has to be written, but if it is, more than 750 words. We want these well-resourced, well-cited uh, pieces of content. So next comes your technology, right? MarTech gets involved. Now at Investus Digital, we work with a lot of different platforms. HubSpot is one of our favored platforms. We are a preferred partner. Um, and the only reason I say that is because you are going to have in one place all of these 
tools that you're going to need throughout this process, right? You've got the cookie tracking, you've got a CRM, you've got an email automation tool, but HubSpot also allows you to curate all of this data and then publish it back up into your advertising platforms. They've got a bunch of APIs for things like that, right? So just take note of what you currently have on your team and start to think about how you would implement this. Um, and there's more to come around that too that I'm gonna break into. But all of this that we're talking about is gonna give you that same uh, reaction and the same ability that you currently have with all of these third-party cookies and networks. That's the real win and why we need to think about this ahead of time. So be transparent. Think about first-party data. Number one, how are you going to obtain that first-party data? And now we're going to start building that data into our own channels. So next, I'm going to get into actually building that first-party data core. This is the heavy lifting. And I say that because it's the new stuff that we haven't yet done. You guys are all likely creating content all the time for your audiences, right? It's just A-B testing and figuring out what they will react best to. Now we need to drill into the actual data, and it gets messy. We've got a lot of different teams at this point that have to be hands-on. There's no one person whose job this is solely. So you've got the dev and IT team who likely built your website and maybe even manage it now. You've got marketing who is usually most tied to those ROI KPIs and, and heads up to the C-suite. You've got the analytics and insights team. And if you're a big enough company, you may even have somebody separately in charge of the CRM making sure that there's reliable data flowing, that it's used properly, and that it stays, stays clean. So between all of these different teams, you all need to come together and number one, look at what you currently have as far as tools. <clears throat> and then number two, come up and define the KPIs that you actually need to track holistically across the board. And it's not just marketing KPIs. Leadership needs to be involved. They're not even on this chart, right? Leadership needs to be involved. Analytics might need to track certain things. The CRM might have different functions than what the marketers, like a social media manager, might be tracking, right? Those are just some examples for you. Now, in our experience working with our clients on such cross-departmental functions here, I would say having a technical project manager in place is super helpful. They can keep you know, the flow and the communication happening. Um, likewise, you also want to make sure that you're meeting regularly to get this done. So on average, at a minimum, we've seen these endeavors take at least six months, which is, again, why we are planning right now, right? So most of the time, these teams don't talk to one another. And here's what happens. We have very disjointed, fragmented information and technology. So some of you might work on the customer data platforms. Some of you are only using internal dams. Maybe you're on the MarTech team, right? All of these different teams, this looks different for everybody, but you've got all of these different platforms and functions not talking to one another. And so we need to create that inner dialogue to be successful moving forward. You likely already even have data that you're sitting on right now. So at Investus Digital, what we've done working with our clients is we've built out processes to not only extract those KPIs from the teams necessary, but we've created systems that pull all of the data necessary from all of these disjointed, dispersed systems into one to track to the KPIs that are most meaningful. And then it spits it out into that fancy little digital uh, visualizer at the end, which probably all of you have some sort of uh, visualized report that you're either getting from partners or internally right now, right? But how are you getting that data? Are you really pulling in all of the teams and all of the functions right now, or is it only coming from something like Google Analytics? That's what needs to happen. And this is the hardest part. So what we did, because this could be honestly a whole half-day workshop, right? What we did was we created a simple checklist for you today to take back and really decide. We've suggested to you which teams to talk to at which stages um, in different phases of this project. So if you go to invd.co forward slash cookies, um, download our deck, you will get an email with the cheat sheet checklist. And in this checklist, we are quite literally positioning the questions you need to ask your team and what you should be thinking about through the pre-strategy, the, pre the implementation, the post, the actual launch phase, right, through it all. Um, 
And th this is a process, right? It's going to take a lot of different decision makers. So at this point, if you're like, oh gosh, I have a headache. Well, it's not time to procrastinate. I'm sorry. And to give you some inspiration here, I've got some fun stories. So Microsoft bought LinkedIn recently for $26 billion. Now, unlike maybe Elon Musk, which is like the outlier right now happening, Microsoft bought LinkedIn for a reason. They have a whole curated list of business people giving them their information about their job title, exactly where they work, exactly their geography, exactly their interests, who they follow, who their colleagues are, what events they go to, right? I mean, the list goes on and on. All of this first party data information upon all of these people who work in business, which is exactly Microsoft's audience. So Microsoft bought LinkedIn because of their audience that was probably organized on the backside. We have Unilever who bought Dollar Shave Club for $1 billion, which was a big, big deal because Dollar Shave Club was a startup, right, that started from scratch. They marketed in the CPG industry to males, which was kind of odd, right? That wasn't like the go-to trying to sell and influence women. And they sold shaving equipment, but they were bought for $1 billion. I guarantee Unilever did not buy them for the ability to create shaving goods. They bought them for their audience. And we know that over time because now Unilever has cross-promoted their other brands and products in the su subscription boxes of Dollar Shave Club, right? They bought them for their first party data to send their goods right to the doorstep of these male consumers. And last but not least, HubSpot recently bought The Hustle, which is a newsletter a news newsletter, um, a newsletter all about business. It is free to subscribe. And we estimate about 20 to 30 million because why? Their first party data, they had this whole list of individuals who were like-minded to HubSpot's audience. This is why it matters. We need to grow our audience today and it can be a huge value for you in the future. So if you're still anxious and you're still freaking out, there's more good news, right? Even if you can't act on these things tomorrow, these tech giants are not just going to disappear. Even though cookies have disappeared already on things like iOS, right? We're not gonna all just abandon Google because all of a sudden third-party cookies aren't happening. So they are right now actively working on several different tactics and things that can help us as marketers better target our audience in the future so that we don't lose all hope, we don't lose all information potentially. However, I will preface that these I would consider as tactics and tools not necessarily a full strategy. I would highly suggest focusing on first party data in your own companies first. But these tech giants are still going to try to solve for these big two pain points, right? You wanna, you wanna have an audience, you rely on them to place advertisements and get an ROI, and they know if they can't get you that ROI, there's gonna be a lack of ad spend, which is majority of their money, right? And you need to start adopting this so that you can better optimize. <clears throat> So just some couple of examples here before we end today. Google's privacy sandbox has a lot going on within it. Like there's a ton of different things, but I, I call out two things just to give you an example because they're pretty pertinent. Interest-based ad targeting, right? Which starts to categorize the user once they land on a website into a couple of different brackets of what they might be interested in. The key here is that it saves this information on the user's browser, right? Instead of a third-party network that's shared all over the web. Same with attribution reporting, right? This info is saved on a user's browser, and basically this is gonna to try to help you connect the dots between two interactions. So if somebody landed on a page and then landed in your cart, right, and converted, it's gonna to try to connect things for you. Again, small little tactics. This isn't, as you can see, like a full-fledged strategy yet. And Facebook's conversion API is going to give you the ability to directly connect with their platform with your own data. So again, taking your own first party data, uploading it into their, um, I don't want to call it a server, but like their platform, if you will, to again, curate lists to advertise to. So your checklist as you walk away here from a high level perspective is make sure that you've got measurement strategy in place right now. Align on your KPIs and what you actually need to get from this information. Assess what MarTech and different CRMs and different tools that you might be using, what are they? 
look at how you're gathering this first party data. How can you look at this deeper than just one form fill of contact us right now? Do you have ways for people to opt out? Again, that's kind of like that user facing good, positive, warm and fuzzy experience. Are you setting server side tagging up using the right UTMs to track the right campaigns and conversion points? Um, and then are you following all of these updates that are happening? We've got a whole nother year until 2024 and who knows if Google's gonna push it again. Um, but now is the time to plan. So I offer you again, our cheat sheet checklist, if you will, but also my team's calendars to you. No sales pitch, we are here to answer questions. Um, if you head to that landing page, you'll see my calendar. Blaine Kinsey is one of our top uh, CRM email automation lead nurture experts. He's one of HubSpot's actually top 100 consultants in the world. So if you're looking to switch for CRMs as well, um, he's a great guy to tap into. And then Paul Headley actually uh, manages and runs our entire team on analytics. So when we're talking about some of that uh, core data, first party data, core engines, his team is the, guru, the gurus, definitely, right? Um, so let me know if you guys have any questions. I would point you to one of these fine experts. And thank you so much.